jumps with Dad. Yeah, I'm playing the jumps. I'm playing the jumps. Come on. Come here. Oh, come here. There you go. Hey. Good job. All right, come on. Oh, yeah, you got the trunk. Good job. All right, here we go. All right. So we'll do grateful. All right, let's do farther along. Perfect. Do farther along. Okay, so this is a this is a good old one. Who wrote this one? Randall Arby. Says W. B. Stevens and Jesse Randall Factor Jr. Okay, there you go. <laughs> now it is. <laughs> All right. Sounds like people have read this song too. Okay, this one uh, we haven't played it in a really long time, but I think it has great lyrics. Tempted and tried.
be grateful in all times and all things at all. And that's a real practice of faith, to be grateful even when you don't understand what's going on or just to know that we have to rest on Jesus no matter what. So, And then there's always, if you start counting your blessings, there's always so many to think of. So. <laughs>
We made it. We made it. And there was so much going on up here. I missed a few chords, I'm going to say. <laughs> And my guitar drop tune and all kinds of fun stuff. But. All right. We're professional dumpster buyers. Yeah. We might have to do that again later. <laughs> time to spend with Bill and Char before they leave the country for a while and um, I wanted to, to ask them I might have them tell us about how they found Jesus tonight they don't have to it doesn't have to be a long thing but I'd like to I'd like to write it down so after we're done but really quickly I want to continue in our study and um, we are now to second John second John only has like 13 verses so really short, but it has it's packed with a lot of things to say. Last week, of course, we covered 1 John, um, which was right up front about what it means to follow Jesus. All these letters were written by John, the apostle, son of thunder, the apostle of love, in the, sometime in the, between the 80s and 90s AD. And so we remember that um, John actually knew Jesus and was, was most like, it was his best friend only one to go to the cross with him um, that we know of, that the Bible talks about. So knowing John at that time would have been this in the 90s AD, especially toward the end of his life, by the time this letter was written, would be like knowing um, the survivor of the Titanic, or what the last survivor of the Titanic, the last survivor of the Holocaust, World War II, World War I. So it'd be kind of that status. Thank you, Carter. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and he brought me my phone while we were playing. Hey, that was really nice. Can and set it up the stand. Oh, um, let's go this way, babe. You, you can mom. take it. Oh, take it now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's go play the drums elsewhere. All right. So, anyway, <laughs> thank you, Helper. I appreciate that. Um, love that little guy. He's so fun. So, he's fun. Um, he was all over the place while we were playing music. It was pretty fun. All right, so also these people, you know, like in Christianity, this was the, one of the last people to, knew, to know Jesus. So then all the new Christians are, are people who never met Jesus. So the last of these people, like John, he would have been the last really person who knew Jesus, like the best friend of Jesus. So you can imagine the status that he had. Um, well, and he was very humble. And he would just go around and say, dear children, love one another. But this, but this book really brings it together. What does that mean? And in this book, it combines truth and love together, which is very important because you can't have truth without love and you can't have love without truth. So John shows that how that is. And if you don't have it together, you have destructive imposters coming in and teaching false beliefs. Uh, Dr. Randall Smith is a theologian I follow online sometimes. He said that 1 John's about sin, 2 John's about truth, and 3 John's about relationships. And what do we always talk, even talking about in the church today? Um, sin, truth, and relationships. So all things that are very needed in our society and give us a lot of things to glean here. So it's a very short book, and so I'm just going to take it through and discuss it briefly. And here's John telling us, what it means to walk according in love and truth, which is walking according to Jesus' commandments. Starting with verse 1 of 2 John, the elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which remains in us and will be with us forever, grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God the Father, from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. And truth is mentioned like four times, love is mentioned three, or no, five. Truth is mentioned one more time than love in this, which is interesting. Because uh, the Apostle John is known for love. So both those are the two keynotes of this letter, truth and love, and how they go together. Um, the Asbury Commentary says both truth and love are keynotes of the short letter. 
the former being used five times, the latter four times. These two are important um, correl correlatives of the Johannian theology. Love without truth is sentimentality. I thought this was interesting. And truth without love is harshness. Interesting. Um, going on. And so also when he talks about uh, this lady, chosen lady, some people, some theologians believe it to be one specific person, possibly Martha. That's just, these are just specul speculations that theologians have. Uh, but there's some tradition that says this was written to Martha. Other traditions, just a very important woman in the church who had the gift of um, hospitality. And so he's commending her. So it says, verse 4, I was overjoyed to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we have received a commandment to do from the Father. And now I, I ask you, lady, and that is not like woman. It's like lady, like um, the lady of the household the lady of the estate, so it's a very um, respected term. I ask you, lady, favored lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we will love one another. And this is love. This is really important, this is the whole thing. This is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you are to walk in. In other words, love is walking according to the commandments. With it, if you remember, Jesus summed up in love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the commandments we talked about last time are summed up in how you respect God and how you treat and respect other people. So you can't have love without truth. So Randall Smith says, truth walks. And so what that means is, True, you're, the way you live is your active demonstration of the truth of Jesus. So, and as John points out over and over, and not everybody likes this, if you, if you are a follower of Jesus, it will show in the way you live. John is definitely clear about that. If you don't, or if you're not acting like a Christian, you might have some rough times, but you probably aren't one. If you continue in that path, you're probably not one, according to John. So, um, John is commending this woman for her faithfulness, for her kindness, for her hospitality. She is love in action. I don't know, I didn't really get to study this deeply, but I'm guessing that she's either a widow, because it doesn't mention her husband, or maybe her husband is not mentioned because he's not a Christian. But either way, this woman is a champion of the faith. She probably hosts a church. Maybe in her household, we don't know. We do know that she most likely hosts anybody who's coming in like to the church and is in need. So we do know that that's her gift. John, it's interesting that John is also commending her children as well. So this godly woman has done a great job and her, in, in her children are following along after her. So this family is known for authentic Christianity. Again, some theologians think we're talking about a particular church. Because, you know, sometimes people talk about churches in this time like ships, she. You know, like how ships are named after a woman and there's a she. So, um, so we don't know, but it seems a lot like he's talking to one particular lady. And we'll get into that more. Uh, John wants to, to make sure that her kindness... The kindness of this family is not taken for granted. And often great people, you can see in this letter, this, this known thing that often great people who love God and are totally authentic see the best in people. And sometimes that can be a problem if, um, if they're not using wisdom. And so John's like, take some warning that um, we need to be careful about deceivers. So, look at verse 7, if you're following with me. For many deceivers have gone into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves, that you do not lose what you have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not remain in the teaching of Christ does not have God. 
So that's really clear. Anyone who goes too far, meaning you're going outside, you're backsliding something, and does not remain in the teaching of Christ, does not have God. The one who remains in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. So now let's, let's look at this clearly. So we can see what is a deceiver. So let's look at these because these are strong words. John calls a deceiver an antichrist. He's not talking about any particular one person, but anyone who's like has views that are don't follow Jesus, as he's very clearly says here. So we see here that um, anyone who denies that Jesus came as a man is a deceiver. He is. This is particularly referring to the Gnostics. If you recall, we talked about Gnosticism quite a bit. And the Gnostics believed that Jesus wasn't really a man, that he was just like a spirit that looked like a man. And so what that does is deny the power of, of God to raise the dead, to raise himself from the dead. And so that's definitely deception. And also anyone who denies that Christ came at all, that Christ is important, that Christ is the Christ, that Jesus is Christ, is also, that is even a more obvious deception. That's more obvious. You can say, if somebody says, yeah, I don't believe in Christ, well, that's easy to pick up on. But if they're like, yeah, I believe that Christ is a spirit of just, of higher thinking, then that's a little more deceptive. People might go, I don't know. And if they wouldn't know Christ and they didn't see him die on the cross like John did, and they didn't see him raised from the dead, you know, only... Only a few only a few people, many of them would be dead, that actually saw Christ hanging on the cross and brought down and put in a tomb. Those people are almost all gone at this point. So it would be easier to, to deceive them and be like, yeah, he was this great spirit. He floated around and said good things, you know. So anyway, John says that's an antichrist. That's a deceiver. Also, anyone who goes too far and walks away, so this is obviously talking about people who say they're a Christian and they're backsliding or they, they're not living it. They're like said they were all in, but they're really not. And John talks a lot about that in 1 John. So if you have any questions about that, go back to 1 John and read what he says. He's very clear on that. So um, then anyone who's a deceiver who tries to convince other people of wrong teaching. And he's very, he's clear. He's like, don't let them in your house. So this woman is so gifted with hospitality that maybe she would be like, hey, come on in. And she has a Bible study. And maybe she's letting them talk because she's nice and she doesn't really know. She knows that they can talk and say, hey, that's not the truth. But what John is saying, if you know these people don't believe what Jesus taught, don't encourage them to come into your house and have a Bible study. Don't encourage that. And when he says don't even greet them, I'm pretty sure he's referring to the greetings that Christians give each other. So in those days, to identify each other, they had some symbols. For one, they were in danger. So the sign of the fish came out so that you'd know these were the site place of the Christians. And they would have certain ways of greeting each other, that identifying each other as other Christians. And he's like, don't identify people as a Christian if they're not acting like Jesus. If they're not walking in the light. If they're not saying that Jesus was fully man, fully God, came and is the Savior, don't entertain them in your household. So, and you know, a lot of people could go a lot of ways. So should you not invite people in to talk to them about it? I don't think that's it. I just, I think what he's saying is don't give them a foothold to lead other people astray in your house because of your identifying them as a Christian. Don't identify them as a Christian and, and give them a place of leadership. So, moving on. If you, if you allow them, if you know they're teaching wrong things and you don't do anything about it, then the, here John says, then you are aiding and abetting the deceiver. Wow. 
So he's pretty serious. So verse 12, though I have many things to write you, I do not want to so with paper and ink, but I want to come to you and speak to you face to face so that your joy may be complete. This indicates that he's close to this person. That's why I think it's a person, so do most theologians. It seems like a person that he wants to see, like a person that he's known throughout his life. So um, remember that John, he took, he took Mary into his home and he was always took care of Mary until she died. So this could even be a friend of Mary's. It could be somebody, he was probably somebody that was around when the church started. Could be, it could be Martha. Could be Mary Magdalene. We don't know. Uh, we do know that um, if the next verse is kind of interesting, it says, the children of your chosen sister greet you. Yeah. Now, who's the children of your chosen sister? Remember, John took care of Mary. So it could have been any one of the, of the famous ladies in the church, or it could just even be a random person who was well-respected. And the chosen, the chosen sister greet you? Could be Mary. We don't know. But it seems to me like he really knows this person. And is, and is, is wanting to go see her, wanting to, um, wanting to be close to her, wanting to have a, a time with her. And so is this other woman that he's talking about, your chosen sister greet you. So based on this letter, we can see that authentic Christians need to be loving and kind. All the commandments, like I said, of the Old Testament and the New Testament are simply teach us how to respect God and how to respect people. So, um, so we can look at, without that, without loving God and people, we can't truly act in love. We can't truly, because how do we even define love? It has to be based on some absolute truth. It has to be based. So we know that uh, authentic Christians are faithful to the teachings of Jesus. That's very clear in all the New Testament. That the faithful, um, faithful people are the people who follow the words and deeds of Jesus. And this is teaching truth in action. Truth has action. You know that they're following Jesus by the way they live, not just by what they say. And what's happening at this time in the church is there's a bunch of people saying stuff. And they're not living it. And they're, some of them are not even saying the right things. And they're pulling people away. And so also this is a letter to cause people to do some vetting. Do some vetting when it comes to uh, teaching people. Like, don't, you don't, you can't just let anybody get up and lead in church. There has to be a vetting process about who's leading Bible study or who's leading. You have to know that the person is sincerely a follower of Jesus Christ. And so, um, and you have to be wise about those who might take advantage of others in the church. So John is saying, you got to be wise about the people coming in. And again, this lady who has the gift of hospitality, it'd be so easy for people to take advantage of her. And I get the feeling that that's what's ha what has happened. So, since living in truth is the main theme, let's examine what truth is. Truth is not relative. It is absolute. And love, therefore, must be tied into truth. Um, this is very confusing for people right now. Because there's all kinds of people saying that just love is love is just what we got to do. Relative, everything is relative, and we just got to love people and be cool with everybody. And that's not what the Bible teaches us. It does not teach us to support everybody's ideas. And that's what this book is saying. So, truth all comes from God. It's all in the Word. And by living with submission to God, we show people truth and love. Since God values people, following his truth will show the value of people. So how, that's what love is. God is teaching us how to love other people. And when we walk in that love, that truth, 
That's what real love is. So what are the consequences of not being truthful with people? So the consequences of not being truthful is if people believe you, then they're misled. If people believe you and you're, and you're not being truthful, they're misled by you and they will act on whatever they believe. We've talked about that many times. People will live by what they believe, what they actually believe. So there are varying degrees of consequences for not being truthful, right? Depending on what you're not being truthful about. Important to notice that evil people will always use deception. The people who love you will always be truthful. And the dangers of the relative doctrine that everything is okay, um, universal everything, is that it has permanent consequences if the people follow that. So if you can think for a minute, if you believe a lie, what are the consequences of that? Depending, depending on the lie. For example, if you went to your doctor and he told you you had a terminal illness. And if you had a terminal illness and only had weeks to live, you'd want to know that. You wouldn't want your doctor to make you feel good and go, oh, you're great. Your health is great, continue on as you were. That would be terrible. Because it changes your, the moments, the last moments of your life would be severely influenced by this knowledge that you did or didn't have. So, so we gotta think about this. Being truthful is loving. Even if the person doesn't like the information. So if you are told everything's gonna be okay, like everything you think is okay, like everything you believe is okay, you can live however you want. If you are told that, and then you end up going to hell because of that, then whose responsibility is it? That's a shared responsibility because, you know, people walk into deception. Once you open yourself up to sin and God's like, don't go there, and you walk in, you walk into deception. Your own sin cloaks you. It cloaks you, and then you stop seeing the truth. And then it takes situations and life to point out the truth. For example, if you told somebody, it doesn't matter how fast you drive on Highway 33, or 26, you can go as fast as you want. What's going to happen? Well, eventually, the person's going to hit livestock. That's first off, right? They're going to hit something. Eventually, they might even hit a car or people. Um, they might get ticketed. So if you tell people, you can go however fast you want on that road, that is gonna have some desperate consequences if they believe you. And I think that's really happening in our society. We're like, you can do whatever you want. It's okay. It's just, we're all loving. We're all gonna include everything. It's all okay. That's gonna have some consequences if it's not true. If the Bible, if, if the Bible's true, you cannot live any way you want. You can't. So, um, Again, back to that, the terminal illness. If you found out today that you had a terminal illness, how would you react to that? Well, you, you might seek treatment. You might see, I, man, I could get some treatment. You want to know how, how bad is the illness. And the second thing you do is you prepare yourself for whatever the diagnosis was. And you could, you could make a lot of really important decisions based on the truth of that diagnosis. And if you only had a few weeks to live, you would sure make more meaningful choices with the last days that you had. So truth is important. Truth is really important to people. We're, we can't be loving. It's not loving to go around going, everything's okay. Do what you want. Everything's cool. Just do what you want. That's not loving. That's not loving. You're going to be okay no matter what. It's all, good. it's all good. That's not loving. And that's what John is saying here. 
Here, so why do people choose to hold back truth? Well, I think for one, and I, and I was thinking about this after I wrote some notes on this, there are people that have heard this so long, they just really believe it. They've, they've walked into their sin, it's cloaked them, and they really believe everything's okay. No, no matter what, where everybody's going to heaven, it's all good. Sprinkle love dust every you know, it's just sort of, they're kind of buying into that. And it's everywhere, it's on TV, it's in music, and it's everywhere. But let's say you're holding back from the truth. You know the truth. You know the Bible's true. Why do we hold back from the truth? Well, we hold, we might hold back on truth to make people feel good. For example, and here's a mundane example. Your wife asks you, how does this outfit look? And let's say it's terrible. Terrible. And you've got a choice to make. You could say, Oh, it's fine. Or you could say, not your best outfit. I mean, you know, that's a hard one. I get it. It's hard. But there's some discomfort in being truthful sometimes. Like, there's a little discomfort. Like, here's the thing, though. What if you said, oh, it's great. It looks fine. But then she has to speak in front of 250 people and she wears that outfit. Right? Ouch. And you did it, because you didn't tell the truth, right? Right? And I know this is difficult. And it, it is one thing for guys, too. They just don't care. And sometimes they just don't know. So it's like, they just say, I, I don't know. I'm not good at that. So, but you, you don't want to, sometimes we hold back the truth because we want people to feel good. And that's not loving. However, there are nice ways of saying There are nice ways of saying hard things. And so John is trying to bring those together. There are nice ways of saying hard things because nobody wants to hear what you know. No one cares what you know until they know how you care. Right? No one cares what you know until they know how you care. So there are people that just go around spouting what they know. And people are like, I don't care. You don't care about anything. But when you do care about people, they listen to you. They're more apt to listen to you. They might not listen, but they're more apt to pay attention if they know you care. So, um, so sometimes we don't tell the truth because it feels uncomfortable. And for a minute, it might bring a little friction. However, again, if we do it as kind and as lovingly as we can, then that, that helps. Like if you said to your wife, you know, that's not your best outfit. How about if you wore something else? Like make a suggestion. That's a very nice way of saying, try something else, right? And, and so we try to do things as loving as we can. And sometimes, it's hard to be truthful. Sometimes, and, and our society is really copping out on this a lot. Like even, especially with like raising children, it's, it's hard to discipline kids. You know, you, it's hard, it takes energy. You have to think about it. You have to be like, how can I best do this, teach this lesson? And, and you know what, people that don't want to do, they don't want to be, they don't want their kid to cry, they don't want to be uncomfortable. They're just like, I'm just not gonna do it. I'm not going to do that. And what happens if you fail to teach your kid the right things? Do you fail to tell them no, or fail to teach them the truth? Then, then you could if you you could end up with a completely spoiled kid who's just like, yeah, it's all about me. My whole life's about me. You know, I'm the center of the universe. Thanks, thanks for existing in my universe. Can I have some money? You know. That's kind of, so it's hard. It's hard to discipline your kids. And even if you do a great job, they can just be like, I, I want to do my own thing now. Because guess, guess what? In our society, that's very popular. That's very, and everyone's going, oh yeah, everybody just do your own thing. It's so cool. We're all loving each other. It's just love, love, love. Everything's okay. And it's not loving. Why do you think more people are killing themselves now than ever before? Especially young people. 
So we told them, oh yeah, it's all about you, love, 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 everybody, everybody, and people are killing themselves. It's not working. It doesn't make them happy. Because what people really need is Jesus. They really need salvation. They really need to leave their life of sin and bondage. If we don't help them, then they're stuck in bondage. They're stuck there. And we're afraid to be truthful because what if they don't like us? Again, if you don't have a relationship with somebody, you got to be very careful how you speak to them about truth. Because I know there are a ton of people who just go around just truth, 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 but they're just mean. And they, they're not very nice. And they don't treat people well. And, that's, and that kind of gets a look back, like, do you really know anything? I don't think so. Because everybody, even non-Christians, know that if you know something, like if, you, if, there, if there is a universal truth out there, an absolute truth, it would make you be caring about people. You would care about the people that can't care for themselves. You would care for children. You would care for people who need help. If there is an eternal force out there that has some sort of moral objective, and you are walking with that force in your life, that if, you were, if there was a Jesus and he did save you, it would show in the way of it. That's true. That's really true. It is. And so again, people, I, people um, do not care what you know until they know you care. And so I'm going to close on this, this whole thing. Loving people takes risks sometimes. And it takes time for you to develop the relationship that allows you to tell the truth. It takes time to develop the kind of relationship where you can bring truth to somebody. And so you can't just go, unless Jesus tells you, just go tell that person right now, blah, blah, blah. You need to invest in that person. You need to invest in the time in that person. You need an act of love to show them something before you can tell them the truth. And so um, I love the words of St. Francis of Assisi. Preach the gospel always, and if you must, use words. And the closing thought is, all the lost people that are around us that don't know Jesus, they are living under some sort of lie, some sort of untruth. And there's a bunch of people, maybe new Christians or early Christians struggling, like they don't, they're searching for truth. And we won't know that, and they won't know it until we show it to them. We, they won't know it until we show it to them. And so with that, I just want to close in prayer. And, um, you know, Jesus always valued people. God valued people. God wants a relationship with people. God loves people. God gets angry when people get hurt. That's what justice is all about. God loves people. And if we love God, we will love people. And if we love people, we'll show the truth. Even before we tell it. We'll live it first. And so I just want to close in prayer, and then I want, to, I want to share for a minute, or have share together for a second. But dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the truth that you've given to us. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the people in my life who took the time to teach me the truth. And they invested in me to teach me the truth because they loved you and they walked with you and they cared about me. Lord, help me to be the kind of person that will love me, lovingly teach the truth in a way that, that people will listen and hear. Thank you that you're a wonderful and amazing God. We thank you for our friends. We thank you that, we, that you've given us so many great friends to share this time. I became very aware this week that we only have so much time and you give us all the gifts of our friends, and thank God we get to be with them forever, Christian friends. I just am grateful for that. But we only have limited time to do what you ask us to do, and help us to use that time well. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm a good